previous uh, linear function evaluation with constant overhead by Strajit Ghosh, Jasper Nielsen, and Tobias Nigels. And Tobias is giving a talk. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to talk about malicious basic here already. So let's start with a small motivation and introduction. Um, standard setting in two-party and multi-party computations. The arithmetic computation of the functions. So we have two parties, party one and party two, and they want to jointly compute some arithmetic uh, circuit uh, on their inputs. And um, the two basic uh, operations that you have to realize for this is uh, addition and uh, multiplication. The addition is typically very easy, especially if you look at sequentiary based multi party computation protocols. But the multiplication requires a bit of work. And um, usually you have this um, one sub protocol for the addition and one sub protocol for the multiplication values. So, as I said, the addition is typically easy and the multiplication requires some work. So, that is what we are going to focus on an actively secure multiplication of uh, uh, two values. And formally, you can abstract this as a oblivious linear function evaluation. Um, so you have two parties, party one and party two. Party one has its input, a value A, and some random value R. And party B has its input, value B. And they want to compute a linear function A times B plus R. So this uh, OLE realizes this kind of uh, functionality. And this gives you a shared multiplication in the sense that party one can send its share to be minus r, and party two sends its share as a, a times b plus r. And if you add these two shares, you get uh, the multiplication a times b. And there are many implicit constructions of such a secure multiplication. <coughs> For instance, uh, speeds uses somewhat homomorphic encryptions, encryption and zero knowledge proofs. Uh, but this has a comparatively large computational overhead. Uh, MESCIT, for instance, uh, uses this transfer and AES. And this is the whole protocol is optimized to work with AES and I, um, AES and I instructions. And although the, the construction itself is not asymptotically optimal in the sense of the number of OTs it uses for multiplication, the protocol is very fast in practice. And then there's um, this IPS on 9, Ishai, Prabhakar, and Sahai paper, they actually build an, uh, an OLE, standalone OLE uh, protocol from oblivious transfer and noisy encodings, but this is only passively secure. And their construction is asymptotically optimal, at least, so they have four constructions in their paper, but the most efficient one is, uh, has a constant overhead. But they su suggest to use this generic transformation of uh, IPS 08 from passive to active security to get an actively secure multiplication. That's the MEC in the head paradigm, so you have to do a lot of bookkeeping and no one really wants to implement it. So although it might be uh, asymptotically the, the best uh, you can do, uh, apparently no one wants to use it. So, and we realized that OLE as a, as a black box is not used very often in, for, uh, in, in practical uh, MPC or two-part computation protocols. So most of the protocols like uh, speeds or mass could use um, ad hoc constructions for the modifications and to some additional uh, tools to get active security. And there's basically no direct construction of an active <coughs> secure OLE. And what I'm now talking about is how to get a practically efficient and relevant OLE in the sense that hopefully you will be convinced by the end of the talk that it is a worthwhile go to implement or to design an act, uh, actively secure OLE protocol. So our contributions on a practical level, that's what I'm going to talk about. It's an actively secure OLE with communication complexity and a very small <coughs> computational overhead. And this uh, 
the construction that we have has uh, an overhead of two over the most efficient passive secure uh, OLE construction. So we basically get the active security for free. And on the technical level, that is, uh, I will only uh, sketch some of these points. Um, we use the noisy uh, encodings similar to the ITS online paper. We show that all noisy encodings, independent of the underlying assumption, uh, are resilient against leakage. And noisy encodings are also robust against tampering. I will get to that in a bit. So let's first have a look at how to multiply with passive security. Um, as I said, I, I want to focus on the noisy encoding version of the IPS online paper. Uh, noisy encoding abstractly consists of three algorithms, an encoding algorithm, an evaluation, and a decoding algorithm. This encoding takes as input a value or a vector depending on which type of encoding you use. Outputs in the set L. This set L is basically a secret key. And uh, then it outputs an in, in encoding. There's also some public information that I uh, uh, didn't mention here. Um, then you have an evaluation algorithm that's a homomorphic, homomorphic uh, algorithm that takes as input one of the one of uh, one in, uh, one encoding and some additional values B and R in our setting and outputs a modified encoding and then there's the decoding algorithm which uses the secret key to output A times B plus R. Concretely, if you have this encoding algorithm and you want to encode an element A, you basically create a Shamir secret sharing or resolvement encoding of this value A. So for instance, you can store this value A at x equals 0 of a polynomial of degree k minus 1. And then you simply evaluate this polynomial in the number of positions, in this case 4k. So you get a vector of of uh, field elements which encodes this, this element. And then you pick a random error with weight 2k plus 1. Um, and L is now the, the index set of the noiseless positions. And the encoding is then simply the addition of this uh, vector a plus the error vector. It's somewhat, <coughs> looks somewhat similar to LWE or LPN. Uh, but it's a different type of assumption. But the assumption is also stated in a similar uh, way. So we we have a pseudorandomness assumption which, which states that an encoding that is generated in this way is indistinguishable from a uniformly random stream. And so the evaluation algorithm now basically works the same. Um, you, um, set your input B to be uh, um, the y-intersect of the poly polynomial B of the degree k minus 1 as before. Also evaluate this polynomial at 4k positions. The same for a polynomial R. But in this case, this R polynomial, which serves, serves basically as a random mass, has to have degree 2k minus 2, basically twice uh, the, the degree of the input. Uh, of B, and then you do a pointwise multiplication. So you uh, multiply the first uh, element of B times the first element of the encoding that you get, and then you add the random mask. And then you get a, a noisy encoding of the, the result. And if you want to decode this noisy encoding, um, because you know the set L, as the secret key, you can simply ignore all the noisy positions. And then you can interpolate the polynomial y. Um, this uh, noisy encoding has 2k minus uh, 1 noiseless positions. The polynomial has 2k minus 2, has degree 2k minus 2, so the interpolation will work. So how do we get from this noisy encoding to a uh, multiplication simply we have the two parties, party one and party two. Party two encodes its input A, 
sets this encoding to party one. <coughs> and now um, the parties use a k out of n of t. k in this case is uh, 2 k minus 1. Um, so party one inputs its homomorphically evaluated uh, encoding into this k out of n of t. And party two chooses the noise positions via its index set. And then it can decode uh, the, the polynomial. And in the way that I described it, it only gives you one multiplication for n elements, so you don't have a constant overhead. Uh, oh, I forgot. So you also get the same uh, uh, shared multiplication as I mentioned before. Um, so if you, if you do it the way that I described, you only get one multiplication for n elements. But if you use uh, packed secret sharing or full read Solomon code for the for the input encoding of this A and B polynomial, then you get a constant fraction of uh, of uh, inputs into this encoding. You have a constant overhead for a multiplication. So this is the, the passive secure protocol. And now I'm going to describe how to get to an active secure version of this. Um, so let's have another look at this uh, passively secure protocol. So what can go wrong? The first problem that we have is um, that if we want to replace the k out of n of t by a maliciously secure variant, this requires a lot more communication. So at least n of n of t plus some additional uh, assumptions and a lot of work. So that would already uh, um, destroy the, the constant communication overhead that, uh, that we want to achieve. And then obviously, uh, party one and party two might cheat in the generation of this encoding or in the homomorphic evaluation. So to solve the first problem, we, uh, we build a leaky k out of n of t. Um, leaky in the sense that at most for the rhythmic number of bits of this input set L, are leaked. Um, and this leaky k out of n of t requires only uh, n maliciously secure one of two of t's. And the, this doesn't work as a generic k out of n of t. It only works if k and n are in the linear the size of the security parameter. So we use uh, these n maliciously secure one of two of t's. And then a row n row, remember, was the weight of the uh, error vector. So we use a row n secret sharing to enforce that the most uh, size of the L elements of this encoding can be learned. So the protocol is very simple. Uh, party 1 now has this uh, modified encoding W. Party 2 has this set L. And party 1 picks one uniformly random uh, value field element E creates a secret sharing and computes a hash on this value. So this basically serves as a commitment, uh, sends the commitment on this value e to uh, party two. And then for each of the n, uh, one out of two OTs, party one sends one element of the encoding and one share of the secret sharing. And depending on whether this uh, element is noiseless or not, uh, party two will, will either pick the encoding or the share of the secret sharing. And um, now party two, if, it, if it's honest, it will uh, be able to reconstruct this value E from the secret sharing. Um, and at the same time, be able to decode. So what we want to prevent is that the party two learns more than 2k minus one values of this uh, encoding W, because otherwise, as we will see later, uh, it might learn some, some uh, information about the input. Um, so this, because of the, the reconstruction threshold, you can, uh, can be sure that if party two is able to reconstruct this value E prime, um, then uh, party two learned at most 2k minus one elements of of this encoding W. And uh, yeah, this hash, as I said, serves basically as a verification so that party two knows that party one didn't 
select some strange input into for the for the secret sharing, which might leak some information about the set L. And uh, party two then has to announce this by E, so party one knows that party two was actually able to reconstruct uh, the value E. So that's the, the first uh, problem. And the second problem is the uh, to make sure that, that the operations are actually carried out correctly. And our main idea is we want to reuse the polynomials that we have to generate for the uh, for the uh, encodings. So we get this A polynomial for, for the input of party 2, B and R for the inputs of party uh, A, uh, 1, and then we get the, the resulting polynomial. And uh, the main trick now is we just pick one random field element. Each party picks a random field element, sends it to the other party. Uh, each party evaluates this random field element. Uh, uh, each party evaluates its inputs on this random field element and sends uh, the result to the other party. And then both parties can locally um, verify that this relation A times B plus R uh, equals y is actually true. And if anyone cheated in the, during the protocol, then this relation will not hold except the negligible probability because we're in a, in a large field. So that's uh, basically the second problem. Um, let's have a look at the complete protocol. So first of all, um, we have to slightly change uh, the inputs um, we use uh, for the for the leaky chaos of NOT. We use a random mask instead of directly using um, the the, modi uh, the the encoding because otherwise, um, if party two is dishonest, it might actually learn the complete uh, encoding. Then party P one will realize that and board, but the input is still leaked. So we have to do it in this, in two steps. So first, we use this uh, random mask. After this execution, party one is sure that only um, 2k minus 1 must uh, arrive at party two. Then we do the basically the passive secure protocol um, to the evaluation on, the, on this encoding, and then blind the encoding by this random mask, and then set this blinded uh, vector to party two, which can then decode. Uh, the noise positions because it has the, the red mask for these. And then in the end we do the check. Um, so there's two remaining problems. The first is uh, the extraction of the inputs and the second is leakage. So I mentioned before that there's some leakage in the problem in the, in the protocol depending on the inputs of uh, part two. <coughs> the extraction Extraction in the sense we we built the whole protocol in the OT uh, hybrid model, so we would like to get UC security. And um, it is not really clear if you look at this uh, protocol here, it's not clear if you can actually extract uh, B and R from this encoding W. At least it's not directly clear. Um, so the extraction against party one is. Um, the protocol, if the protocol succeeds, the simulator will get um, a correct decrypt, uh, decoding of the result, A times B plus R. And it also gets the complete uh, encoding that uh, RD1 enters into the, into the OT. And then it can simply subtract the, the noisy version with the non-noisy version. So for each uh, noisy um, position, you have two values. Um, and this allows you to basically remove this, this random mask here, and then you, uh, the, the simulator is able to, to uh, compute the value B. And once the simulator has the value B, it can also compute the value R. So that's the extraction idea. <laughs> Uh, against party one and against party two, because we simulate the uh, chaotic energy, we simply learn the 
complete set L, and then can encode uh, the encoding. So there's one additional uh, problem here. This extraction only works if uh, party one doesn't manage to add errors only in noise positions. So if there's an error in the noise position, the check with the polynomials will always lead to an abort of the protocol. But we could imagine this, this scenario where party one manages to add errors in uh, noise positions. And this is not checked by the polynomial because the honest party will never see any noise position. So uh, the main, uh, one main result of our paper is that if the adversary manages to add more than a logarithmic number of errors in the noise positions, then it can already break the pseudorandomness assumption of the encoding. And then there's the leakage problem. Uh, basically, if party, the same, the same problem, if party one uh, chooses inputs that are not checked by the check, it can learn a subset of this uh, set L. And we show that if the adversary manages to distinguish the encoding from pseudorandom, given this leakage, it can already distinguish without the leakage. Um, OK. So I want to highlight some other applications for this. We have uh, in the paper um, the construction of an efficient oblivious polynomial evaluation protocol, uh, efficient in the sense that we have uh, order of the degree of the polynomial of communication that is probably uh, optimal in the sense that uh, if you've been in the, in the UC setting, then uh, recently we had a CCS paper which uses this OLE as a black box and requires only constant number of, of these multiplications uh, per authenticated multiplication and also is statistically secure. So the communication overhead of this uh, paper instantiated with the OLE that I just presented um, is lower than the current, with the previous best. And uh, quite recently, we, we put, uh, put an imprint the private set intersection protocol, which also makes use of this um, OLE, also statistically secure um, and has an asymptotically optimal communication. Overhead. So there's a lot of possible applications for this OLE, and if and the additional actively secure OLEs might lead to the efficiency improvements in a lot of different areas. Thank you. Questions? So the security assumption that we use is, as I said, this, this uh, noisy resolvement encoding that this is actually pseudorandom. That is, I, and there's, right now we don't know a way around this because if you, so there was a recent paper at Crypto where they built a noisy encoding from uh, LPN, from an LPN type assumption. Um, but this doesn't give you the this uh, multiplication property that we need. So if you use a, an LPN, for instance, if you use an LPN uh, noisy encoding, we don't know how to get this constant overhead for full multiplication. So they only get a vector OLE, basically where you have one uh, one party has a vector as an input and the other party only has a scalar. And we want to multiply two vectors. So that's why we we actually rely on this, this resolver uh, encoding. So it's a it's not as good as, as LWL or LPN. And my second question is, uh, can, do you think this uh, implementation is good to be with the uh, mass cards and similar kinds? We believe yes. So um, from a computational point of view, we have only log n uh, basic uh, field operations per, per multiplication. and uh, 
uh, we know we already know that from a from a communication point of view, uh, the the overhead would be less than than uh, mass kit. So uh, typically, communication is the bottleneck in these uh, two-party communication protocols. Other questions? Okay, thank the speaker again.